Can everyone see my PowerPoint and hear me? <laughs> okay, thank you, Petro. Hello, everyone. Um, well, it wouldn't be April 1st without a twist. Uh, when I was asked to do this talk, uh, Pietro wrote me and said, you can pick your date. And when I saw April 1st, I thought it would be really fun. I was like, oh, I wonder if some, there will be some exciting April 1st moment for me. And it actually was. So at the time of the invitation, you might have seen some marketing for this event with this title of my talk and this title of my job. But um, let me see if I can do this right. But a bit has changed. And as Professor Drucker said, I am now at the University of Houston, where the scope of my responsibilities has widened. And I'm happy to share that my days are varied and I'm relishing the opportunities and assessing the challenges. And now my nearly second month on the job. Indeed, since agreeing to deliver this talk, my professional and personal foundation and context has certainly changed. And I felt a reflection during this moment with you all was warranted as I take on this new important role at Houston. But rest assured, my years working within the special collections arena has been so instrumental in setting my foundation. So you might hear some of my enduring ethos born from that setting within my talk today. I intentionally use the word learner as I want to align with the part of the audience who are learners students in courses now, and those of us who are lifelong learners, wherever we are in our career and personal paths. I also want to direct my words today to those of you just beginning your library journey working in libraries. And because of the domain of expertise and experience I have, I will primarily be speaking to the aspects of academic libraries in my context. However, I, have, I hope that my more general approach to these lessons may prove useful for those of you aspiring to be or currently working within public, private, special, community-based, and other sorts of libraries that encompass our entire community of practice. For those of you deeply entrenched in management now, this may seem familiar, and I hope you get something from my lived experience in this talk. So why 10 lessons? I wanted to keep it to a decent number that traverses a lot of key points of change management. I'm confident that I know there are a lot of mini lessons within the lessons that I bet all of us could workshop for hours. I have a lot of sources that I developed these simple ideas, but I'm gonna just list some of the general sources that I used for you. Foremost, my colleagues who taught me were, were when I served as their leader, their direct report, or their peer. Secondly, I want to make a big shout out to social media. I'm not the best at it, I admit, as a creator, but as a consumer of the content, I have learned very quickly the value of the discourse, the immediacy of the issues, the personal experiences our colleagues have gifted us and learning more about our field and ourselves and the sheer expertise that keeps me an avid reader of a lot of eFora. I commit about one hour of my day, usually during my morning coffee, a bit at the lunch hour and then during dinner so I can log on and check out and see what's going on. I'm grateful for when someone directs me to a very important poster thread. So my overarching lesson in all of this is that I go to where my future colleagues and my current colleagues and friends are dropping wisdom with such pith that I admit that I can be a little jealous. I'm not really known for being pithy, but I try. The third thing I look to for setting these lessons is I read library and academic related publications and actively seek publications written by colleagues from historically marginalized backgrounds as their experiences often connect more closely to my own. And lastly, I'm grateful for my network of friends and colleagues, some of you in the room. We share articles, links, posts with one another, sometimes drinks, and keeping up is essential to me. And I never tire of just asking for advice from a trusted friend, a colleague, a wisdom exchange buddy. That is invaluable. And it's present in each lesson that I'm gonna talk about today. I wanna begin by sharing gratitude. First, I wish to acknowledge the many people who have populated this nation's land throughout history, particularly from where I am today. I honor their memory, and along with my own ancestral bearings rooted in the Gulf of, 
the Gulf Coast and Mexico, I commit my work to ensuring their histories and those we are shaping now are not forgotten nor neglected. I wanna thank Professor Johanna Drucker and Pietro Santechiara, Bernard and Martin Breslar Fellow for inviting me today to speak and affording me this space to adjust my talk to my present position and framing it in a way that allows for you all to get a sense of the me behind my words. I also wish to thank every single one of you. This is an extraordinary, sad, powerful and paradigm shifting moment we all find ourselves in. That's a lot a long extended moment encompassing a gamut of emotions, experiences, changes, and challenges. I know like me, you bring that to you, with you every day to your classes, your offices, your entire days. Thank you for being here today. And I hope to honor your time wisely. I'll tell you a little bit about me if you haven't met me before. I'm Latina, Latinx. I'm a cis hetero woman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a mother to Jake, who's in LA right now with a lot of aunties in the room who will take good care of him. I'm a rare books librarian who became a special collections director, and I'm a library dean. I've worked at a great many paces, places, people with colleagues, I can't begin to say how much they've affected this talk, and Johanna mentioned them, but I want to say them again. My friends and colleagues at North Carolina State's Archives, Louisiana State University, the University of Miami and Florida, the University of Michigan, Penn State, UCLA, and now my alma mater and in my home region of the University of Houston. I've enjoyed the opportunity to participate in the rare books and manuscripts section of ACRL and ALA, and I have worked with and have a deep fondness for my many colleagues and friends in the Society of American Archivists. Every place I've worked and now work has made me the kind of leader I am today. I've always been deeply interested in interrogating barriers, systems, assumptions, and norms. With respect to how I think about libraries, I'm a firm believer that there is no such thing as front of the house and back of the house. We are simply degrees removed from helping our researchers, students, faculty, community partners, and each other seek, identify, evaluate, and use resources, and also to produce original and creative content. It's exciting but it's a big responsibility. I mentioned my cultural background. Being a Latina is incredibly central to my work. I am not your typical library dean, but I'm working to change that every day. I have witnessed a lot, especially as I've grown in leadership in libraries. Some was hopeful and promising. Some was disappointing and tiresome. I get tired. I get defeated. I get angry. I have sought ways to balance my life with such great influence by so many of our colleagues dedicated to our exercising and prioritizing self-care. And I hope you're all doing that for yourselves. So underscoring all of this, I have these lessons is essential. The work I do with social justice, anti-racist and inclusive activities that I do every day throughout my career. As my colleague and friend, the director of the film and television archive at UCLA, Mei Han Dong said, and I love, if you work through, I'm sorry, here it is. If you want DEI baked in, then expect some heat. Let me say that again, because I messed up. If you want DEI baked in, expect some heat. And yes, dialogues and addressing our work through an authentic, diverse, equitably, equitable and inclusive lens can result in some heated topics. I have been there and I'm there for them so we can get through them together and be better collectively to advance the process of change at systemic and structural levels. I have my own working style just like you that's very unique to me. So take what you want from this talk and leave behind what doesn't resonate with you. That's totally cool with me. Let's get started. There you go. Bringing us back to the moment, as I was thinking of preparing for my talk in February, I came across this tweet and I asked Alexia Hudson Ward at MIT for permission to use this in my talk because I realized the deep truth in her words. Change is a given and managing change is not a small or isolated act in the work of a leader. And change management is not just nested in the domain of managers. It belongs to all of us because it's ubiquitous in nature. 
So here's how I approach change management every single day in a few lessons. I don't always get it right. And there are many people in this room that can attest to that. And I certainly make mistakes, but I learn from them. And I have these lessons to keep me on my trajectory of empathetic leading and feeling grounded in my confidence. Lesson one, understand your local context. Uh, I'm gonna be using shorthand for my name. So underneath you'll see Ajax, that's just how I refer to myself in this. And that's gonna give you how I'm working with this lesson in each one. So Houston is a diverse and sprawling city. It has very strong industries and an established and renowned art center. We're also hiring right now. Uh, so please take a look at our website. Many people originating from cultures all over the world call Houston home. And that's the other part. Houston is my home. I grew up in Richmond Rosenberg. So you can see that down there on the left. And if you look between Richmond Rosenberg and the University of Houston and that space between, that's where I went to community college. So my entire formative space took place right there in that town many, a couple of decades ago. I'm not gonna say many. <laughs> So when I think about the local context text of my university, I always think about this setting that's around me. LA, Ann Arbor, State College, Baton Rouge, they all have their different local contexts and Houston certainly does too. So when I think about how I'm going to do change management, I wanna strategize a quick way to get the lay of the land. I establish one-on-ones, but I always ask people who they think I should meet because maybe those critical stakeholders are a little bit more nested in areas that I haven't discerned on my own. I always ask open-ended questions as opposed to yes, no questions. And here's why. It helps people fill in the contours of existing practices, what they do or they don't do. And I can get a stronger sense of the why or the why not, rather than not at all, never gonna change. So I try to get them talking and sharing with me what the challenges are. I share my work style. In the first conversations I have with people, I tell them that I think out loud, that I enjoy dialogue, that I'm a morning person, that I'm super high energy, but I understand that my work style is not the same as everyone else. So I need to honor the work style of my colleagues. And I try to meet them in settings and at times that work for both of us so we can be effective. Uh, something that's really important about my local context and possibly when you're thinking about change management is your boss. Um, they will give you a lot of time to onboard, to nest, to get grounded. But remember, even though you're just starting and you may have a year or two to make some big structural change, decision-making has its own timeline. So sometimes you have to make a decision immediately and you may have only been there one or two months. And this is a very Im impact-driven decision. So what you wanna do is make sure you're talking to everyone so that you get all the levels of communication that you can at the beginning. Speaking of communication, lesson number two. Communication is a skill that needs constant practice and honing. I center my entire approach and leadership, leadership aspiration on being an effective communicator. I have to practice it every day Every day I adjust as I learn more how people understand me in an email, in a Zoom meeting, in a face-to-face -face physical distance meeting. And I am constantly aware of how I'm sharing ideas with them and how they're sharing back with me. Learning how to communicate with individuals, not assuming that everybody can react to your communication style will immediately get you on the road to certain kinds of change management than if you decided to say, everybody has to talk to me at this time and this hour and in this way and nothing else. So here's ways that I deep dive into change management. I try to be clear and consistent. I'm honest when I don't have information. It's really hard as a leader to say, I don't know, but practice it. It's fine, it's refreshing, and actually people respect you more for it. I respect my leaders when they say they simply don't know. Be honest about when you plan change and front load all of that by letting people know, hey, when I'm finished with all of these things in mid-May, I'm gonna have an all staff meeting and I'm gonna talk about the next steps. Get people in the context of your long-term plans. They can't read your mind, so share and share. I tend to be mimetic, which means I try to give statements that are one or two sentences and I repeat them in different contexts. 
I really lean hard on my colleagues in the leadership group, such as department heads and senior administration to help me message effectively. Um, I, ex I emphasize that it's extremely important to me that we are messaging the same way and in equitable way so that one department doesn't know more than the other or one department doesn't get enough information and they have to learn it in the break room. That's really when, when our communication has broken down. I also enable ways for people to offer feedback and reach out, reach out. at uh, UCLA and now at the University of Houston, I do a dispatch here at UCLA, at University of Houston, I do a weekly dispatch. And this is just a rock skip of my past week. Maybe there's some information, maybe there's some emetic repetition going on in there, but also it's just a way for them to get a sense of me every week, what's she up to, what's going on. I also do, um, that in, a, in an email, so it, feels, it lets people feel compelled to respond back to me. I also have a bi-weekly optional office hours that everybody can come to. It's not recorded, I don't take attendance, but there is a Qualtrics anonymous survey that people can submit questions to so that you can dissociate yourself from maybe a complicated question. I'm a new dean, I'm a new leader. Maybe some people aren't sure how I'm gonna react to something. This diffuses all that. Ask me the hard question. I'll try my best to answer it. I also have official all staff meetings and leadership meetings because those are important for me to be accountable to the work I'm doing. And all along the way, I'm documenting my plans. And I check in when I've made a change, I reach out to the, the team that might've been most affected. Like, hey, have you heard anything from your, from your colleagues within your department? Is everything all right? How was the messaging? I do the same way to my boss. I send her an update. We meet um, once or twice a month and I make sure that she knows some of the things that I'm up to. And again, with external stakeholders. So you're looking at a picture of my typical week and it looks like a lot of meetings and a lot of Zoom, but hold on, hold on. I'm not meeting all the time. There's actually um, some of those boxes are dedicated for reflecting on specific topics, on answering some questions. So as you can imagine, as a, as a very busy administrator, I have many meetings with different topics. So maybe in the morning, I have this uh, conversation with the with my colleagues in liaison services. And in the evening, I talk to someone in facilities. Well, I wanna make sure that that topic that we were talking about, that I'm thinking about that on Wednesday. So I have time on Wednesday. So I'm like, hearken back to what you thought about. It just helps me keep track of my, of my days, but please don't think I'm really like work, working like a robot. I leave space for spontaneity, things get in the way, but at least I can go back to my calendar and see some of the things I needed to reflect on. This is a good moment to shout out my executive administrative assistant. Her name is Stephanie Florencio. She keeps me on track and she saves me every day from that blue blur from crashing. Lesson number three, understand structures without ignoring the people within them. This is a big one for me too. All of them are big. I'm gonna keep saying that. Um, when I think about the organizational chart, I see it as a place for people to share their experiences, what resources or training or time they need to address some of the expectations of leadership. And the, leader, and the organizational chart gives you a picture of who's responsible for what. So in essence, my ethos about an org chart is where the picture of responsibility where you're reporting your experiences and directing expectations. And it should be cyclical. It should be all the way around. Org chart should be one, but not the only driver for how we regularly communicate, collaborate, or connect. I'm very clear about the parameters and my expectations, but I also want my colleagues to flourish and have meaningful work to do that's mission critical and core library work. All of these things can happen when I'm engaging beyond the organizational chart in various ways and understand the influence, the power and leadership all across that network. Lesson number four, define and learn the external influences on your decisions. Your boss, their boss, the Board of Regents, the community, all of your users, donors, community partners, cultural agents on and off campus, the disciplinary experts all across your institution, they are all vested in your work, whether you see it or not. So when I think about change management and I'm thinking about reaching out to external influences, I always ask questions about how do you, would you define the library? How do you perceive our organization? Tell me what's working well. What reparative work needs to take place for us to develop 
shared goals in tandem with one another. It's also a good time for me to advocate for my teams and I share what's possible for the libraries. I look for ways for mutual benefits to be centered so that, I may, that, that my colleagues are empowered to get the work they wanna get done. I like to bring voice externally to the things I've been hearing in the library. Sometimes I think about what my boss or the provost or what the president of the university says, and I try to do this exercise where I imagine something they said in a meeting or in a report out, and I thought, I think about their statement, I say, in the library, it looks like this. I say that to myself, it's a very important exercise for me. They'll say something and I say, in the library, it looks like this, and I start to jot down what it could look like so that if I'm being asked questions, they can get a strong sense of what I'm up to, and I can get a strong sense of their goals and where they think areas the library need to improve or advance or where they think we are doing just right. This is really critical on how they will influence my decisions. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding how they're interpreting me rather than the vice versa. Lesson number five. Define and learn the internal influences on your decisions. I'm talking about everybody that works in the library regularly, how they interact, how they collaborate, how they share projects, how or do they pass the baton? Are my leaders empowering their teams to flourish and have meaningful work to do? And I think about my our coworkers that are working in facility, facilities, the custodial staff, people that are responsible for our HVAC, and then I circle back to the website and the lib guides and what our e-presence looks like. And those all things can be affected by the internal influences that are happening. And then because almost all of us, if not all of us will walk into positions that have already existed or the institutions themselves have existed, there's some activities on deck, there's things going on, there's priorities already in action. You need to know very quickly, what, quickly, what are we doing? What's happening? I like to get those information and then periodically walk through my spaces and I'm intentionally walking through my spaces with different people. I've walked with the associate dean and get his sense of what we're thinking about. And then I'm walking with the um, head of information access services. I visited all my uh, specialized libraries to get a sense of their spaces. I think if you're thinking about change management and you're not thinking about the physical experience of your colleagues, you're really missing a big gap. So have a, have a mental map of what they, when they say, oh, you remember that door that didn't open all the way or that group study room that, that this one group has taken over. I can, I can remember that because they've took me on that tour already. Something else I'm doing internally is having one-on-ones with every single person that works in the library. It is a lot of work and I'm excited to do it. And I finished later this month, having met with about 105 people. I just did about three or four today. And it's been really exciting to get to know everyone. It helps me understand the organizational health, how we're interconnected and what the climate is. So I can get a stronger sense of when my leaders tell me some of their concerns, I have some reference to the people and what their concerns are and what they were talking about. Number six, be mindful of your words and how you define them. Ooh, that might be the biggest one. I don't know, they're all big. But this might be the biggest one. Okay. This is huge for me. That's my Twitter. Uh, I have on blast right there that words are first for me. They come before books and libraries and the multiverse and even my own opinions. I really think that words are so powerful in how we use them and what we say. I think about them carefully. I choose them with intentionality. When I move into a new ecosystem and when you move into an ecosystem and you're thinking about change management in your existing ecosystem, thinking about how people define words, particularly those abstract nouns or those really um, uh, powerful adjectives, really think about how they're defining them because sometimes there might be um, some people thinking they're innocuously using a term, but it might have inherent bias or be embedded with microaggressive impacts they're not aware of. And I try to get at that. I'm very direct and I'm very calm. Please explain to me how you're defining that word in the context of library policies and procedures. I'd like to understand how you're using that because let me share with you how I interpret that word within my cultural context. Because some of these terms can be used as barriers to social justice and inclusive work that has to take place in the library. So let's, let's think about how we're defining our words. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I might, I might be in the minority in this group, but I'm gonna stand by this. 
I'm okay using words like pivot and innovate and flexibility and resilience and transformation. I'm okay with all of those words so long as two things happen. Number one, that we have a shared lexicon, that we understand what that means. And when I say transformative, do I have action? Do I have examples? Do I have for instances? Then don't use it. Don't use it. Don't, don't use it as just an overarching term. Really plug in the activity into those terms because they can be powerful and they can be resonate across different communities of practice, but you really want to make sure that you can plan your action underneath these words. So I think about that. The second thing I think about is, did I put enough energy into the spaces, the infrastructures, and the practices to be resilient or to be innovative or transformative? Or are they just really hard walls and I'm, I'm leaning on the people to be extra flexible, extra resilient? That's not cool. So when I think about finding ways where both the people and the systems are playing shared roles in these terms, it can be essential when I'm using them to talk about change. Make time for reflection, number seven. In 1997, I know because that's the year my son was born, I started a work journal. I'd been keeping a personal journal since I was about nine years old. I'm one of those journalers. I love it. I advocate for it if that's how you roll. Um, I've kept a work journal since 1997, and I'm pretty consistent with it. Um, but now in my new role, I have a new journal just started. Uh, I wanted to just make a new chapter with my new role as a dean and really dive into what it means to be a dean for me. There's a couple of reasons I'm going to be really vulnerable here right now and share something with you that I didn't think I would. Um, as of today, as, as I understand it, I could be corrected. There are, there is one Latinx dean in an R1 institution of a library and you're talking to her right now. That's huge, it's, uh, it's a big weight. I understand the symbolism and the representation of my role. I know that I don't represent all Latinx people. I'm not the spokesperson for BIPOC awareness, but I know that I have a very unique space that I'm trying to make room for in my colleagues. So when I'm thinking about what it means to be a Dean, I'm really thinking about what it means to be a Dean and the representative space that I exist in. So I can create my own construct. And maybe when that next Dean from a Latinx background comes in, I can reach out my hand and say, hey, you wanna do some writing together? Do you wanna talk about this experience together? I certainly love all my BIPOC deans out there that have been working with me and reached out, but I will be very excited to, to engage with a, with a Latino, Latina or Latinx person in, in joining me in, at, this, at this position. And I will also say that there are plenty of Latinx deans and in other institutions that have molded and I've, I've thought about their work and all of those things. And I'm very excited about their work as well. So when I think about my journal, I reflect almost daily, um, almost several times a week, if not every week. I write goals, I write my intentions, I write down my fears, I write down everything. And I try to encourage that with my colleagues. I haven't done too much here at the University of Houston and our reflection time was a little bit paused at UCLA because we went straight into a post COVID or a COVID environment. But one of the things I'm doing here is, for example, when I send a, um, an open-ended feedback request to my um, department heads, I often say, let me know if you need more time. This is my deadline. Let me know if you need a few more days. Um, don't feel like you can answer everything. Interpret it the way you want to. I really want them to feel like when they're giving me their, their true thoughts on something that I'm not going to use in this draconian act to make a decision. It really is time for me to reflect on their words. The other thing I reflect on are the changes that I'm making, speaking of change management. This is something I did do at UCLA and I'm doing here is thinking about when I make a change, I work it through my mind. I think about the questions, the criticisms, some of the reluctance I'm witnessing and think about forming answers in my journal. I write like, okay, what about if, they, if I get asked this? How would I react to that? How would this make me feel if someone told me to do this? I try to get to a minimum of about, um, a minimum of about 100% understanding. And I try to get as much as I can, a maximum of 100% understanding and 100% agreement. That's not always the case, but you never want to be in a situation where nobody agrees and nobody understands. That's a fault of leadership. Make sure that you can get people to understand first and you'll get the agreement if it makes sense to everyone. And that's your job when you're doing change management to share some sense making. I have this uh, tagline where I say, if I can't say why, 
then I shouldn't say so. And that's something I live by when I think about making some changes. Lesson number eight, develop your prioritization approach. So um, when I always, when I think about my prioritization, I start with my values. This is, we're talking about approach and I'll, I'll, I'll work through this with you if I hope this makes sense. Um, I start with my values. I value the people I work with. I value their experiences. I value their impressions mapping to the reality that I'm trying to set for them or vice versa. I value the mission of the institutions. I value being an empathetic leader who's approachable. I value, I value addressing the immediate needs so I'm not the bottleneck. I prioritize where we need sustainable structure because there's expectations of sustainability. I think about the impact of my decisions. So I say to myself, if I make this a priority, what, does, what happens to this group? What happens to this group? What happens to this one person's workflow? So I really have to think about a lot of things when I'm making some decisions. And again, I don't always get it right, but I try my best and I try to find ways to, if it doesn't work perfectly for someone, let me help make it work better for them. Um, when I think about the final thing, which is second to last in my list, this is something I learned in all my jobs, but particularly a shout out to my colleagues at UCLA. Harmony is so important, and they taught me that. And we talked about what is the harmonization of our workflows, of our shared capacity, of our systems, our systems in terms of our interrelationships, but also our tech systems. There's a lot of invisible technology that we just think is out there, but those things are not harmonized then your relationships could not work sometimes. So we have to think about those different areas of where our work is taking place when it's not just person to person, but person's data to person's data usage, right? What does that look like across your department? And harmony was a big word for us, or for me when I worked at UCLA, and I take that with me. That's a very important lesson that I add to my toolkit. So however you decide to generate your prioritization approach, be intentional, write it down. Refer to it when you need it. Remember, this is how you're going to prioritize, not what you're going to prioritize. That's going to come later. First, develop your rubric. Make sure it's flexible, that you can address it over and over. But as soon as you get to the what's, you can start to develop a way to scale them to this rubric. So just make sure you have a center of what you think is fundamentally important to be an initial driver and in how you set priorities. Number nine, build your network with care. Okay, so whether you're in an institution with 2,000 people or 40,000 people, you can't have a network with everyone. It's not going to, you're going to have to make some decisions about where you're going to um, put your energy, the work of your colleagues, all of those things when you're thinking about your network. So when I think about establishing a network, I immediately go to people with whom I have shared goals. We're all thinking about mutual benefits. And I also think about areas where I should dive in quickly in contexts that might need some reparative work. Um, it's going to be those delicate conversations, but they're super critical for change management, because if you're really trying to affect change through many different lenses, then you want to make sure that you're not disempowering or um, minimizing the impact that some of these colleagues that in the past may have felt shut out, invite them back in and see what that feels like. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be hard, but be there for it. And this kind of exercise of building your network can help you see where your changes need to happen sooner rather than later sometimes. And they also have a really interesting temporal impact in terms of the timeline. When I think about the, the network that I build, I also ask them like, what are your long-term goals? What are some things that you, your, your super aspirational goal if money were no object? And this really thinks, helps me think about their long-term vision alongside mine. And it really makes me think about how I'm going to be, think, um, how I'm going to be addressing some of the the changes that I'd like to take and how I'm going to prioritize them with that rubric, remember? Number 10, be of your time. Whew. Okay, saving the best for last, not the picture, not me, sorry, I said that all wrong. Saving the meaning, the, the meaning of this for last. Um, this is really big for me. It's really hard one for me to articulate. And I don't have much of a script for this one because I really want it to be authentic and open. When you're thinking about change management and you might be new or not new, but you're trying to bring change, 
Remember that you're gonna be inside of existing ecosystems where there's structures, there's an established work climate, there's situations taking place, and every person in that role has some kind of investment in what's happening now. You also may or may not have a predecessor. And you need to understand, particularly if you're new or first or moving into a role, that your predecessor has already set some priorities. People feel like they're in this move. So you want to make sure that you can, you can navigate what they said. Do all that. Be open to it. Listen and learn about what people want to, but hear me now. Be in your moment. This is your moment. And it's okay to say, hey, I want to course correct this. I want to move us into a new direction. I want to make things happen in a different way. I want you to enjoy me, to join me in experimenting with a new construct, a new approach. Honor those who left you those great opportunities and relationships, but be in your moment. Because I told you at the beginning, this is a huge moment, but it's our moment. And I hope you'll join me because we're all here to support you. Thank you very much.